Hello, everyone, and good evening. Welcome to the opening day of the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival Virtual Showcase. I am Nick Cha Kim, and I'm a multimedia journalist for Spectrum News One. And tonight, I have the honor and privilege of moderating the first talkback. So thank you for joining us today as we kick off Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month with the first ever Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival Virtual Showcase presented by Visual Communications. From, from celebrating our histories and cultures to mobilizing our communities to be socially and politically active, we present the virtual showcase to keep us connected. Today, we highlight the PBS series, Asian Americans with Renee Tajima Pena, S. Leo Chang and Grace Lee. But before we begin, please join me in thanking our partners at the Center for Asian American Media and their producing partners, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Flash Cuts, ITVS, PBS, and WIDA for making this happen. And thank you to our many, many community partners who joined us in solidarity. They are Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Los Angeles, Asian Cinevision, Asian American Documentary Network, Austin Asian American Film Festival, Boston Asian American Film Festival, Center for Asian American Media, Chicago Foundation for Asian American Independent Media, DC Asian Pacific American Film Festival, Disorient Film Festival, Houston Asian American Pacific Islander Film Fest, Pacific Arts Movement, Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival, Seattle Asian American Film Festival, Toronto Real Asian International Film Festival, Vancouver Asian uh, Film Festival. This showcase is brought to you by our partners at Comcast, NBC Universal, Sony Pictures, Nielsen, HBO and Warner Media and National Geographic Documentary Films. For more info, please visit vcmedia.org. Asian Americans is our opening day film for this exciting festival, a film series that delivers a bold, fresh perspective on a history that matters more today than ever. As America becomes more divisive and more divided while facing unimaginable challenges, how do we move forward together? Told through intimate personal stories, the series will cast a new lens on US history and the ongoing role that Asian Americans have played. This docu-series is scheduled to premiere on May 11th and 12th on PBS at 8 p.m. with episodes one and two on May 11th and episodes three, four, and five on May 12th. Joining us tonight for this talk back are Renee Tajima Pena, Grace Lee, and S. Leo Chang. So a little bit about them. Renee Tajima Pena is an Academy Award and Emmy Award nominated filmmaker whose credits include Who Killed Vincent Chin, My America or Hawk If You Love Buddha, and No Mas Bebes. Tajima Pena teaches social documentary at UCLA, where she is a professor of Asian American studies, the director of the Center for Ethno Communications, and holds an endowed chair in Japanese American studies. Tajima Pena has a long history of media and community activism as the first paid staff person at Asian Cinevision, a member of the Center for Asian American Media and one of the founders of Asian American Documentary Network. She graduated from Harvard College where she worked alongside students of color to agitate against apartheid in South Africa and in support of ethnic studies and affirmative action. S. Leo Chang is an independent documentary filmmaker with the Emmy Award nominated film, A Village Called Versailles, about the rebuilding and transformation of the Vietnamese American community in post-Katrina New Orleans. His other films include Outrun and Mr. Cow Goes to Washington. His latest film, Our Time Machine, is currently in distribution and has been supported by ITVS, Sundance Institute, and the Tribeca Film Institute. Grace Lee is an independent producer director and writer working in both narrative and nonfiction films. She directed the Peabody award-winning documentary, American Revolutionary, The Evolution of Grace Lee Box, The Grace Lee Project, and Off the Menu, Asian America. She has been a Sundance Institute Fellow, a 2017 Chicken and Egg Breakthrough Award winner, an envoy of the American Film Showcase, and is co-founder of the Asian American Documentary Network. She is also a member of the documentary branch of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. She is currently a producer, director on And She Could Be Next, a new documentary project about women of color transforming politics and civic engagement. Thank you all for being here and congratulations on such an achievement. 
All right, so let's get started. My, my first question goes to Renee. Given our current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic, as you look back at our history, do you see parallels with what is happening with Asian Americans today? Oh yeah, I mean, the history, um, it's eerie. And I think, you know, Leo and Grace would say the same thing that all the way through the production, even before this COVID crisis, we would be going through these moments in history and think, you know, is that, it's like a weird deja vu, even though we weren't living back then, but all of the, the, the themes, I mean, filmmaking, you call it themes, but all of the, the issues and what I call the fault lines of race and immigration and class in the United States, all those fault lines that erupt at times of crisis like that, they, they've all been there since the time Asian Americans arrived. Um, uh, Grace, uh, if you'd like to uh, elaborate on that, did you also find parallels uh, in producing of Asian American? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I think anytime you look at history, you know, it's a way to understand the present. Um, and in particular, um, the episodes I think that people just watched um, in episode four when we're talking about the birth of consciousness, the Asian American movement, you know, a lot of times when we're, um, you know, when we think about you know, young people getting together, organizing, you know, we think about the 1960s, but, you know, going back through the series, you know, I did the episode two, which is also, you know, the World War II era, you saw that there were people always resisting what was happening to them, you know, during the Japanese American incarceration, you know, there's always resistance, these themes of resistance, there's these themes of oppression, but, um, you know, you can always find, you know, an evolution, you can always find a pushback, and, and to me, that was, um, you know, it's heartening because, you know, we, go, we look at history to understand where we are today. And I think one of our goals in making this series was to bring these, um, you know, these themes to, to make them relevant to like a present day audience. Leo, you, you produced the first episode, is that correct? Yes, yes. So you, you told the, the story of, the, of Chinese Americans coming here for the first time, going back 150 years. What parallels do you see happening today with what happened way back then? Um, I remember some of the archival material that we came across. There were all these cartoons, um, you know, people selling just random things, uh, advertisements where they paint uh, Chinese people as like, uh, uh, you know, rat face with the rat tail and, you know, diseased and, and all of those themes are literally, you know, being proposed again uh, during the pandemic right now. Um, it's a little bit shocking how literally the history is repeating itself. And, and you know, it, it is a little concerning. Um, I think that that for us, you know, we're, we're in some ways grateful that the story is coming out now, uh, that our series coming out now, I think that that folks can see, uh, uh, you know, and hopefully learn from the lessons of history, um, and and to see how uh, uh, this you know this environment you know has has been um, the, the this condition has been something that Asian Americans have faced faced before, and hopefully we will overcome again. You mentioned lessons. Um, Renee, are, are there lessons we can take away from watching Asian Americans? Yeah, I mean, other than, you know, 150 years of trouble, in, in a way, directed towards Asian Americans, it, Asian Americans have been fighting for 150 years. I mean, it's amazing since they first landed here, you know, they haven't taken the shit. Um, in Leo's episode, it's the, like Wong Kim Ark, who came here. I mean, no, he was born here. Wong Kim Ark was a US citizen. He was a Chinese restaurant worker in San Francisco in the late 1800s. And when he was denied re-entry to the United States, he didn't take it. He went to the US Supreme Court and challenged it. And as a result, he set the precedent for birthright citizenship, which is why many of us are citizens or why and why many of our parents are citizens. Because now if you are uh, born to immigrants, even if, if they're undocumented immigrants, if you're born in this country, you are a US citizen. And that was 
you know, due to this, this restaurant worker from San Francisco in the late 1800s. So all the way up through, you know, Grace's episode that people just saw today, the, um, of the Asian American movement in the 60s and 70s through the, you know, recent times with, in episode five, Gita Ganber's episode, um, Teresa Lee, who's Korean, she was born in Brazil, but her family immigrated here. And um, she was, you know, she's 1.5 generation. She was raised here and she was the first dreamer. She inspired the first dream act. And she's been a um, advocate and she's been a part of the movement for undocumented immigrants, you know, ever since she was in, a student in high school and college. And she remains a, an advocate to this day. So it's that, that, activism and that activism we're really seeing today. So, you know, these are extraordinary times, uh, especially with this pandemic. Um, but uh, Asian Americans did start out the year with some extremely visible accomp accomplishments, such as the, the final season of Fresh Off the Boat, Andrew Yang running to be the first Democratic presidential candidate and uh, Netflix just released Never Have I Ever by Mindy Kaling. For me, uh, there's something about having a PBS documentary that makes me feel that Asian Americans have arrived, that, that we're being seen. Um, for you, Renee, was there a moment for you specifically, whether it's a pop culture moment or a social justice moment where you felt similarly that Asian Americans have arrived? Actually, two moments, pop culture, or I wouldn't call it pop culture, but in terms of cinema. One was when I was very young, uh, just out of college, and I saw Chan is Missing, and it just blew my mind because, I mean, first it was great entertainment, but then it was familiar. You know, he shot it in Chinatown. There were the kind of people I knew from the, the student movement, the Asian American movement. And then the second time was Better Luck Tomorrow. And seeing Better Luck Tomorrow, that was in the early 2000s, I thought, oh my God, this is really great. I mean, this is this means that, you know, because it was also self-critical, I think both films were, were bold in that they were, you know, were not trying to be namby-pamby, you know, the sepia tone kind of view of, of Asian Americans and Asian American community. They, they were really looking at, all sides. So I thought that was really exciting. I'd love to ask this question of uh, both Leo and Grace. Well, well, let's hear from Leo first. Well, I, I, you mentioned Andrew Yang, but don't forget Kamala Harris and, and Tulsi Gabbard. Thank you. you know, whether or not you, you agree with their positions or not, and, and in some ways that also demonstrate the diversity within the Asian American community. Uh, besides the sort of the racial diversity that, that we have, but also the diversity in ideology. So that's not assumed that, you know, everybody um, have the same background and the, and the same, same approaches and the same agreement. So that to me was very exciting uh, to see them, um, you know, being seriously considered, not, not just uh, as, as candidates, uh, you know, sort of sideshow candidates, if we will, but they were, um, you know, uh, really a lot of folks supported them. So that was really exciting. Grace, how about yourself? Um, I mean, if we're talking about 2020 um, pre-pandemic, uh, I mean, for me, like seeing Parasite win Best Picture and all those Oscars was pretty incredible. Um, you know, that a foreign language, foreign language um, film wins, you know, the, the highest prize in cinema and it's an excellent film as well was really, revealing and also just, you know, there's so many parallels. Um, the fact that Parasite can win Best Picture and then we're also, you know, in pandemic, seeing how countries in Asia like Taiwan and South Korea, you know, have been able to handle this disaster, you know, mm -hmm. much better than, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've just been thinking about, you know, my parents who immigrated from Korea in the early 60s, you know, and, you know, for many years, like who would ever think about, you know, a small country like Korea being able to, you know, sort of show the world and show the United States how it's done in terms of, you know, the pandemic. Um, so anyway, just recent examples, but there's so many other examples in the episodes that we, you know, um, produced that there are so many moments that I, you know, as a, I studied history in college, you know, I 
feel like I am kind of have leaned into Asian American, you know, documentaries and storytelling, but there are so many stories that were completely new to me while producing this series. Um, this documentary series, I understand, took many, many years to produce as documentaries do. Um, and I know a lot of folks that are watching right now are filmmakers, likely documentary filmmakers. So I'm sure they're gonna be interested in hearing about how Asian American came together. Can you talk about the genesis of this uh, documentary series? When did this process start, Renee? And what did it take for it to actually, you know, go into production so that we can enjoy it today? Well, it's, um, it's something that a lot of us have been wanting to do for many, many years. I mean, Lonnie Ding, who's really the godmother of Asian American documentary, uh, did, made Ancestors in America, and she intended it to be a series. Uh, it was never finished as a series, but it's the whole full story of Asian America is something, you know, we've been wanting to tell, and it's just been really hard to get off the ground. But around 2012 or 13, Jeff Bieber from WIDA, um, which is one of the co-producing stations, it went to Cam and he also went to me and said, you know, let's do Asian Americans. He had produced um, Italian Americans, Latino Americans, and I think Jewish Americans. And we said, yeah, you know, we, we've been wanting to do this and maybe the time has come and it really helps to have the clout of a PBS station, but it took a number of years, you know, of course, to raise the money. We also want to put together an Asian American, primarily Asian American team, so that the series came from an Asian American perspective. And, you know, we spent time to build towards that. Um, by the time it was greenlit, and by the time we start, started production, I think that was around actually pre-production around August of 2018. So it was really fast from the time we started. I mean, it was maybe a year and a half, something like that for five hours. For me, that's like fast because mm -hmm. it takes me 10 years to make one film. But um, yeah, so we were able to get Leo and Grace and Gita and just this amazing team together. Um, Jean Chen is our creative executive producer and um, Don Young from CAM is our executive producer along with Jeff. So it was, it was, and Mark, uh, Mark Harris is our consulting producer, not Asian American, but we made him an honorary Asian American. Now I understand you actually started this in, in 2013. And by the time you got into production, it had been, a, it had taken five years to, to raise this money. Is that right? Yeah, basically. Yeah. But you know, that's pretty common. That's the nature of documentaries? Yeah, and um, yeah, especially Asian American documentaries. That's why Leo and Grace started ADOC, the Asian American Documentary Network, to really kind of try to push the field forward and make people aware, you know, this is who we are. Also get a Asian American documentary filmmakers together to have clout as a collective force to really demand uh, more resources and a place at the table. I would also add in terms of the production, I mean, you know, we did this all at Flash Cuts based in Los Angeles run by Yuri Chung, who's the executive in charge of production. And, you know, almost everyone on the crew was Asian American, you know, from a really diverse intergenerational um, multi-ethnic and not just Asian Americans who worked on the, on, the, on the series, but it was really amazing to be able, you know, you really can, and a lot of them are, you know, graduates of Asian American studies at UCLA or wherever. Um, and it really was kind of a labor of love. And it was great to see how people could pull their knowledge and, you know, community and personal background together to help make this series. If I can add, yeah. Yuri runs Flash Cuts with Walt Louie, mm -hmm. who's been a longtime board member of both VC and CAM. And the, if Lonnie's the godmother of Asian American documentary, Walt's one of the godfathers of Asian American documentary. For some reason, godfather sounds different than, than godmother. <laughs> godmother, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I also want to run and sort of focus on the, the multi-generational, the intergenerational nature of, of the crew and the, and the team. Um, and, and also the fact that a lot of the non-Asian Americans um, on our team are, are the POC, uh, you know, filmmakers of color, 
but the intergenerational piece, I mean, Renee gave me one of my very first jobs out of film school when I finished USC um, in early 2000s. And Mark Harris, who Renee just mentioned, was my department head. Um, so it, it, it was a, a sort of amazing, um, you know, I, I, it, I felt like I sort of made it, like I'm now, now working with folks who I looked up to, who, you know, uh, who, who sort of paved the way and, and really took care of, uh, of me and my colleagues when we were coming up. So that felt really special. And, and you know, when I heard that this series was happening, I really just wanted to be a part of it just because, you know, it was an incredible opportunity. And um, sorry, one more shout out, Lonnie Ding. I mean, I worked on Lonnie Ding when she was on, on Lonnie Ding's ancestors when I was just starting out too. And Lonnie Ding's, you know, stamp is all over this series as well because somebody like her who was documenting Asian American communities her entire life, like starting in the 70s and 80s, you know, in the 80s, um, we used a lot of her, you know, oral histories um, that, really rounded out some of the stories. Like for example, in episode two, you know, she interviewed members of the Uno family um, who are now either deceased or, or, you know, in their late eighties, but she interviewed them back uh, when they were in their fifties. And it was, it's amazing to be able to dig into these archives, visual communications, you know, who is sponsoring this film festival. Um, their archive also was a integral part of, you know, um, creating the series as well. So we can't, you know, Asian American, Asian Americans, the series doesn't exist without Asian American media and community organizations like Center for Asian American Media and BC. So, you know, we really rely on previous documentarians to help tell these stories moving forward. So uh, very interesting. We just got a question from uh, somebody out in the public. Uh, this is a question from Linda. Thank you for watching, Linda. Please ask the panel if they've read John Cho's editorial on how our acceptance as Americans is always conditional and can turn on a dime. It's a question. Of, um, um, yes, uh, I actually did read that editorial and I found it uh, uh, very compelling. Did you guys get a chance to, to read it? Uh, I believe it was in LA Times, right? Yes. I, I didn't read it in detail. I, I took, took a glance at it. But you know what he what he said was very interesting because it's kind of it, in light of uh, COVID nineteen and the somewhat the 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 more recent uh, racist attacks that uh, very many Asian American um, Americans have been experiencing. I've done a few stories on them. I know my station also has as well. Um, because at the start, Grace, as you were saying, when when Parasite won the Oscars, there seemed to be so much love uh, for Asians and Asian Americans, and then all of a sudden. Once this, uh, once the city shut down, it really did turn very quickly. Um, what can we learn about that so that things like this, you know, so this doesn't actually happen again in the future? Well, I actually think we need to know our history. You know, I mean, one of the reasons I was so excited to participate in Asian Americans is, you know, these things keep happening. History keeps repeating itself because we don't know our history. The more we know, the more we can understand what are the forces that brought us here. Um, I think that, you know, I, I saw a panel the other day where people were saying they've never, young Asian Americans saying they've never experienced racism before. And I thought that was really interesting because, you know, um, we have evolved, you know, in some ways, but in many ways, you know, it just these fault lines that Renee mentioned at the top of the Q and A, are just covered up and they become more exposed when we get into you know crisis situations um but if we understand you know how did these move how did these um systems get created and what are the what are people doing to resist them i think we can move forward we have another question uh from the public this is a question from cap uh kappa psi epsilon alpha chapter um Thank you for spotlighting some of our campus slash community org, uh, organizations at the uh, end of the generation rising episode. Um, how do you think media is helping the movements now? I believe this is a question for Grace, right? How is media helping movements? Uh, thank you for spotlighting some of our campus community orgs at the end of the generation rising episode. Uh -huh. How do you think media is helping the movements now? I mean, you know, we need storytellers to tell these unheard 
you know, these invisible stories that, um, and, you know, media like Asian Americans, the series is moving things forward, I think. Um, if we don't talk about these things, then they remain forever silent, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, to me, it's it's all about, you know, I got into filmmaking because I wanted to see people that look like me. I wanted to, you know, hear about the histories that I knew existed, but I wasn't learning about in school, right? Or I wasn't seeing on television or wherever. We're in a different situation now where we have so much access to media, but how do you actually, you know, frame these stories in a way that help us better understand where we come from. <clears throat> I mean, I think that's that's the real um, challenge these days, you know, to like cut through the noise and understand, uh, you know, how your particular movement or community group is contributing, right? Or I'm sure Renee, this is what you teach at UCLA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as I always say, as a filmmaker and a you know social issue filmmaker filmmakers, I don't believe, make social change. I think it's movements, it's, it's people, but we have a role to play in terms of, you know, like what Grace was saying, in, in terms of telling stories, um, not only so that our own communities can identify like where they've been, where they're going, but also to, you know, push it out to other people, to non-Asians. And, um, yeah, I think it's, you know, we all work closely with different community groups. I mean, that's, again, a reason why ADOC exists. It's, it's um, to connect, one of the big things we do is connect young filmmaker or all documentary filmmakers to different community groups and, um, you know, just try to nurture that collaboration. Um, I, I also think that, you know, just remember watching Grace's episode and, and hearing, and also Gita's episode and hearing, you know, people like Hari Konobalu and, and Viet Thanh Nguyen talk about how, like, when they first saw uh, uh, Margaret Cho, you know, or, or uh, you know, the, the uh, Joy Luck Club, and even though it's not about our community, they, they both said that, even though it's not about our community, it was something, the only thing that we could hold on to. But now we actually have so many more great representations uh, you know, to that we can see on TV that that we can um, you know see as our role model, and we're hoping that the, the series become part of that. You know, that, that the the younger generations can come up come up and say, hey, you know, I saw myself, I saw my stories, I saw my ancestors' stories, um, and and I think that that in that aspect, the media very much uh, is helping with the movement and helping with the the resistance and helping with the realization of of our American identity. You know, that's really interesting what you bring up about Hari and Viet because, I mean, as for a long time, even back to the 80s, there's always been this question is, especially when Asian Americans got, the population grew and we got so much more diverse, it's like, well, do certain groups belong as Asian Americans? Are we really, you know, Asian Americans anymore? Like, what's our identity? And so you've got in a very organic way, like Hari Kondabolu, who is South Asian, who looks at Margaret Cho and says, I relate to that. Maybe, you know, she's Korean American, she's a woman, but she tells me that as a South Asian man, young man, maybe I can be a comic too. Or Viet Thanh Nguyen as like a college student or young, he must've been a college student picking up the Joy Luck Club by Amy Tan, by a Chinese, you know, I think she was multi-generational um, Chinese American and saying, wow, these are so powerful and being inspired to write stories about the Southeast Asian refugee experience based on that. So they just organically, I think, saw themselves as Asian Americans. Although, and, but I will say in college, they also took Asian American studies. I mean, Viet Tan Nguyen, <laughs> took Asian American studies from Elaine Kim and Ron Takagi. And, and that really, I think also, you know, he talks about how that kind of moved his consciousness. Um, that was Grace's episode, episode five, four, four. episode four. <laughs> yeah. um, I have a question for the episode producers, um, Grace and Leo. Um, personally, I, I can't imagine the responsibility you must have felt to be in charge of uh, telling a story that would essentially be regarded as a definitive story for all Asian Americans, America being 
you know, a melting pot uh, with so many different Asian ethnicities with their own unique stories coming to and living in America. Uh, so uh, question first to Leo this time. Um, about, it's a question about your process. How did you decide which stories to tell out of all the stories that you uncovered in your research? So, so Renee, our boss lady, actually came up with the, 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 <laughs> the big sketches, you know, that she's a series producer. So she has the overall vision of the, the narrative from episode one through episode five. So they were already stories uh, chosen, um, you know, and basically Grace and I and Gita, you know, we, we work with it and then we, we um, modify it, we form it, we shape it. Um, sometimes we bring in new characters and new elements and new stories, actually, uh, you know, to sort of strengthen this narrative that 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 we are hoping to to build for the whole series. Um, it was really hard. Five hours is absolutely not enough to tell the diversity and the, the depth of the stories that we have um, in the community. And there were all these amazing research that we've come across that we really tried to work in uh, to the shows that just did not make it and and it's you know it's 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 sort of a, a very disappointing in some ways but but that is just the the limitation of the medium um so uh so for us yeah we we sort of dug in you know with the help of, of our team and uh did really extensive research we try to identify um, personal stories from each of uh these these pods of stories if we will uh that can you know share the history but not in a, a uh, sort of an expositional way, but through personal experience of, of they themselves and their families. Um, and I think that that's kind of the, the approach that we all took. So Grace, uh, you've done quite a few uh, documentaries uh, covering the Asian American experience for you. These stories that were outlined by Renee, were these stories that were already known to you or uh, did you dis discover them uh, during the research? Um, I mean, just sort of the top line I had I had heard about, you know, some of these stories um, in episode four, which I think people watched, um, you know, I had heard about the get grapes. I mean, I didn't know anything in detail, you know, like one of the most surprising stories for me actually was the Filipino farm workers, you know, who mm -hmm. started the grape strike, you know, in Delano, California. And that was a really moving story. Um, and, you know, it's it's something you know. I, I I studied history, but I didn't study Asian American history. Um, I am interested and have made films about Asian Americans um, society. But you know, one of the exciting parts about being on the series was personally like digging into you know in more in depth stories like um, you know the San Francisco State. I knew that there was an ethnic studies strike. Students struck um, in 1968 to get ethnic studies, um, but I didn't understand like the details of it, you know, and, and what was one of the, what was great was, you know, a lot of the folks in some of the episodes closer to the present are still alive. So you actually get firsthand, you know, kind of primary document type of um, research. Um, and that was really exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it was completely new or, or there's so many, you know, we used to, you know, I always say, <laughs> Like, you know, we have five hours to tell 150 years of American history. You know, there's other series, um, you know, Ken Burns gets 13 hours to tell country <laughs> music story, right? Or the Roosevelt's get 16 hours, one family, right? But Asian Americans get five hours. And, you know, I hope that this, you know, I hope that this series really is almost like an appetizer, you know? Like I didn't worry about it being the definitive one because I know that people will continue to make things in response to this and go further in depth into some of the, you know, like each of the four or five stories in one episode could spawn like another feature documentary, right? So hopefully people will be inspired to do that. Um, and also, you know, just kind of along that line, I also want to acknowledge the, the Asian American filmmakers who made work that actually inspire some of the stories, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we would not have been able to tell the Patsy Mink story without Kim Basper's film about Patsy Mink, you know, because uh, she is, she was such a, a sort of an undiscovered, uh, you know, hero of, of Asian American history, you know, and, and Renee's film, Renee and, and Kristen Choi's film, Who Killed Vincent Chin, 
you know, the reason the, the Vincent Chin story is in episode five with Helen is because of that film. So there, you know, that you can see that throughout the episodes that there were these stories that have been told before, but we were able to kind of, um, you know, uh, sort of find the essence of that story and incorporate it into the, the narrative. And then there were all these stories that are just, have never appear in our consciousness. Um, and a lot of that came from scholars who have done incredible research um, so we're just really grateful for the source material that we had to choose from. Yeah, episode yeah. four also has, you know, Marissa Arroy made the film Delano Manongs, um, which was a great, you know, research tool for us. You know, we were only covering a little bit, but people should watch that film. Um, and just and the then, resources uh, with, sorry. So, no, then Mark Swelga. Oh, right. Um, Mark Harris. Made in 1968 Swelga, or something. You know, um, about, you know, the grape strike focusing on, you know, Cesar Chavez and, and Dolores Huerta. We use that footage in our film. So it sort of comes full circle again. <clears throat> and then just the incredible knowledge of people on the team, like for example, Yuri, and master's graduate from Asian American studies, Yuri Chung, who is executive in charge of production. She's the one who went to, you know, UCLA Asian American studies with Roger Viet Chung, who is, you know, doing the roots program at San Quentin. And it was just, you know, Yuri told me about that. I was like, this is incredible. Like that Asian American studies has continued and evolved in this way 50 years later, um, you know, just across the Bay from, you know, San Francisco state. I don't think those 19 year old, 20 year old students would have imagined that it would be continuing in this way. And, and so that was just a great sort of, you know thing to discover in the process. Like that wasn't in the treatment originally, but you know as you work on these projects, other themes start to emerge and you, you, know, you realize that you know, Asian American studies in the 60s, the drive to get that spurs you know, pe professors who are teaching people like Viet Thanh Nguyen at Berkeley, you know, Ham Tran at UCLA, who's also in episode four. And then you know, this new generation who's learning from those who you know, studied from those scholars. So uh, Leo, you brought up uh, the story of Patsy Mink, uh, the first woman of color to be a member of Congress from who, uh, Hawaii, who also happened to be third generation Japanese American. I, that was one of my favorite stories um, because I hadn't heard of her. You know, I had heard stories of, of course, Senator Daniel Inouye, and it just somewhat made me realize it, the, the history, the limited Asian American history that I'm aware of is, it, it leans towards men. Can we talk about the contributions of Asian American women in our shared history, such as the first dreamer that you mentioned earlier, Renee? Um, um, go ahead, oh. Leo. No, I, I always joke. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of the few men on the crew, but I always am very proud that I have the feminist episode. <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 Patsy Mink. Yes, absolutely. I mean, sexism has absolutely to, to do with it. And, and, and that's, and, you know, that's faced the fact that patriarchy run, runs rampant, mm -hmm. uh, rampant in um, Asian American community. So um, a lot of the contributions were minimized. Um, the men were held up, but the women were uh, uh, sort of ignored and not acknowledged. Um, again, like if you, if you love the Patsy Mink story and you sh everybody should, because she's amazing, you should all check out. Uh, Kim Basper's uh, PBS film that Cam also co-produced with Pacific Islanders in Communication, uh, uh, Patsy Mink Ahead of Majority. I think it's available uh, online, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I think that one thing that we're really proud of is that we also have a lot of um, women scholars telling the stories. Um, you know, I mm -hmm. think that, that right, even oh, though- yeah. it, yeah, everybody from Helen Zia um, all the way to you know some of the younger scholars like Ellen Wu and then Jane Hong. Um, you know, people have different perspective. Men and women have different perspective. Let's face it, the experience is different, and and the the stories that they can share, um, you know, it enriches the the existing um, Asian American history. Um, and I think that the ladies will probably have more things to say about that. I don't want to. Mono monopolize this little question. So, Grace, please. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm always going to lean into making women's stories, voices come to the front. Um, you know, in but you know, in in reality, like in episode four, Lorene Chu, yeah, you know, it's a great story. You know, how she joins, um, how she went from a you know, protected, overprotected, you know. <clears throat> girl growing up in Chinatown to becoming, you know, arrested during the San Francisco State Ethnic Studies strike, you know, 
you know, we have the Vietnam, the Asian American Vietnam War soldiers perspective in the film, but we also have a woman, Lily Lee Adams, and she talks about, you know, her experiences, you know, being mistaken by her fellow American GIs as a prostitute, right? Um, I think it's really important to include not just Asian perspectives, but a diversity within the Asian American experience, whether it's by gender or, you know, ethnicity or age, all of these things really matter. Tammy Duckworth, right? Like we have, oh, yeah. we have so many strong women in this series. Um, yeah. um, you know, growing up, I think we become uh, familiar with like specific histories as it pertains to an ethnicity, such as uh, Chinese Americans working on the railroads. Um, so uh, I'm wondering what was the turning point moment for Asian Americans to, to look at us as a collective? How did we uh, start to embrace our identity as an Asian American versus a uh, Korean American or Cambodian American? Well, that's still going on. I mean, I think that's been, we always cite 1968 when Yuji Ichioka um, coined the term Asian Americans, you know, in the midst of the whole student, the strikes at Berkeley and um, San Francisco State and the Asian American students, you know, getting woke all over the country. But it, it's, it's a dynamic process because at that time, you know, we were such a small minority and we were mostly just Chinese, Japanese, and Filipino. That was like, mm -hmm. you know, the vast majority of Asian Americans with a common labor immigration history. But then you have, after immigration reform, it's like, we now we're like 20 million. We were, what about a million? Like when I was growing up, when I was a kid, now we're like 20 million. And dozens and dozens of different ethnicities, Thai, Burmese, you know, Pakistani. Um, so the, the question of identity and who is in this umbrella of Asian Americans is always there. But when we looked like in episode one um, that Leo directed, it's, you know, it starts with a Filipino story and then it moves on, you know, there's Chinese story and a Japanese story. It moves on to, you know, significant South Asian story because different ethnicities have always been here and are, you know, go back in terms of Asian American history and the common history of um, colonialism and also a common history of, you know, the labor immigration with all of the different groups, it, it was really, I mean, I teach Asian American studies, I should be ashamed of myself, but I was shocked at how deeply entangled we've been. And again, you know, sitting on the same fault lines, um, being looked at the same, and then having such similar kinds of responses and similar histories. So we do have a question from the public. Uh, this is a question uh, from Jean. Again, thank you for watching, Jean. Um, was there conflict in defining Asian American as it's such a huge umbrella term? Did you guys have a conflict with that? I don't think so. No, I mean, th so this is an interesting idea, right? For, for us, you know, with the Asian American Documentary Network, uh, ADOC, which is the, the collective of, um, documentary filmmakers, we really, we have this vague criteria of, you know, do you self-identify as Asian American? You know, it, it feels like, you know, we talked about, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, I, I think that there's there's a lot of gray areas here, but, but one of the things that we talked about in episode one is about how, you know, May and I had that great line of like, race is actually a social construct, right? Um, and, and, and we do know that, you know, especially on, on the, the outer edges, it's just much vaguer and it's really up to the individuals to, to see, you know, even uh, if they relate it, identify with the experience that the, the, the majority of Asian Americans um, identif identify with or, or have gone through, right? So like, you know, Central Asians, um, Middle Easterners. Um, so it really all depends, I, I think. So, but for us, I don't think we necessarily had that uh, struggle in definition. We knew that we had to actively include folks who are outside of the dominant East Asian narrative, that that was really important for us. Um, so. Okay, we have a question from JP. Uh, he says, 
Thank you so much for hosting this Q&A. What are some ways the general public can learn about Asian American history and issues if they don't have access to resources such as Asian American studies classes? Well, I think this documentary series is a good place to start. So we'll yeah. go there. They can buy a DVD, it'll be streaming. Um, yeah. There's gonna be a curriculum, K through 12 curriculum that Asian Americans Advancing Justice is putting together and it's going to be pushed out through PBS Learning Media. I think they, I mean, they reach millions of teachers. Um, but yeah, even beyond this series, there, there are a lot of resources. I mean, the Smithsonian has an Asian Pacific American program. Um, wow, there's the different Japanese American museum, the Chinese American museums. There are resources out there if people look for it. But hopefully one thing the series can do is amplify the existing resources. I think that th there's a lot that already exists in terms of Asian Americans, you know, Asian American storytelling and film and organizations and different kinds of resources, but it's just a matter of like really amplifying it. Also, um, we're going to plug ADOC again. <laughs> well, um, I was just about to ask, that was yeah. my next question. If you could really talk to us about ADOC, please. Well, I mean, don't Asian, American, Asian American Documentary Network, it's a, you know, collection, a collective of Asian Americans working in nonfiction, whether we're filmmakers, curators, writers, scholars, but mostly filmmakers, in, ranging from emerging to veteran, award, Academy Award winning, all kinds of people. Um, we organize, I mean, if you just go to a-doc.org, um, you can learn more about ADOC. And we also have a database of Asian American films, Asian American content made by Asian American filmmakers. So. It's also a, a great way, a resource for people wanting to learn other stories. Now, uh, we have another question from Alicia. Uh, she says, hello all. Uh, as a doc process nerd, at what point in pre-production did each episode structure core become clear? <laughs> did you all start pre-production with an overarching structure for the entire series? Many thanks. Yeah, right. <laughs> We're all laughing. <laughs> you mean at what point before picture lock did the structure <laughs> <Right>. together? <laughs> so uh, there was no point. It was just right before picture lock. You're like, this is no, what's sticking to the. <laughs> they, they were very, you guys had a structure. I mean, there's I a general it... structure, you know, like there, we had treatments, which Leo had alluded to before that we modified and you know, sometimes you do an interview and it's just, it's not very good. And like some storyline that you thought was gonna be the anchor isn't really there. Um, I mean, that's the kind of the bane of documentarians existence. Um, but a lot of it, you know, comes together in the editing room where you find this incredible piece of archival material, you know, next to this, you know, interview or, you know, we were finding archival material at the very last minute. I mean, there's a piece of, um, archival from the uh, the hearings that they were held, held in the 80s around um, people who are in the Japanese American concentration camps. One of our characters, you know, we, we find footage of her there, which Renee, you know, tracked down at some library in Chicago, had never been digitized before, you know, things like that. Um, and I just want to shout out my editor for the episodes, Aldo Velasco. I mean, just working in partnership, I mean, so much of the process is in the editing room. You know, you're constantly writing, rewriting, editing, re-editing, rewriting again, adding music, all of this stuff. It's 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 an ongoing writing process. So. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the stories were getting swapped around, um, you know, way into the, the post-production process, uh, for sure. Uh, you know, and also we were constantly re-examining what each story what the core idea of each story is even though the 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 characters and the historical uh facts were the same it was how we framed it you know what theme we teased out in each of the the specific story uh you know was just evolving and constantly changing and i also want to shout out <laughs> our editor Victoria Chalk and also our story producer, Kate Trumbull. Um, they did so much heavy lifting in researching and, and, and pulling together 
the stories and 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 you know pre-production and then you know uh, coming up with these surprising sequences in editing that I didn't even know you know existed in the footage. Um, so uh, the the team really was just incredible. And and Gene Chen, who's known as being like story guru on the East Coast, and Mark Harris, who's like the story guru on the West Coast, and we had both of them. It's like amazing, you know. I was telling somebody. If I had both of them on my films, I would probably have like 10 Academy Awards. By, I mean, because they're just like, you know, really clear eyed about just the whole, you know, the big picture. So, yeah, the, the team was amazing. I mean, the editors and the producers. And so speaking of editing, um, was was there anything left on the cutting room floor, so to speak? Stories that you wish that you were able to include, <laughs> but couldn't due to runtime and budget and lack of archival material. Only got five hours, remember? <laughs> is that a real question? It is a real question. Well, <laughs> tell me this. Give me your your this story that ah, that one story that you wish you could have included. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a long list, right? That's a huge. Well, I, I, just just the themes that I that I wish we touched on, right? Like I, I, you know, we we were really exploring wanting to have a story on the Korean adoptees in episode three. Mm. Uh, you know, we just couldn't find a right character and or you know the right place for it. Um, I also think that there's interesting stories around multiracial Asian Americans that could be told. Um, again, you know, there's just all these incredible sort of directions that we could have gone. The hope, you know, and, and as we always say, the hope is that this is a starting point that uh, these wonderful emerging filmmakers, Asian American filmmakers will be inspired by some of the stories and then go off and make their feature length doc from, you know, either the ones that are in the series or these stories that are unfortunately not being able to include it in the series proper, but that we very much, you know, um, regret and, and we, we very much, you know, want to have that story being told, so. I mean, it's, you know, we've talked about how it's multi-generational and we made the series just, we built upon films that have already been, you know, and like new pathways that Lonnie and different, you know, Marissa who made the Delano Manong and, um, Frida Mock, who followed Connie Young Yu to Angel Island. And then what we've always said, and this is something Jean Chen talks about a lot, is she hopes that the segments will be taken and different filmmakers will make it into, you know, feature documentaries and we'll just take the, the stories further. I mean, there is that one story of the, in episode one, um, Moksad Ali, who's a South Asian silk trader who came in the late 1800s, right? And his, um, he married an African-American woman. A lot of South Asians, because of anti-miscegenation laws, settled in African-American or Mexican communities. And his son, Bardu Ali, became like a big band leader with Chick Webb, I think it was, in New York. And then he discovered Ella Fitzgerald. Then he came out West and he was Red Fox, the comedian's um, manager i mean like a really colorful life so hopefully someday maybe one of you guys want to do it <laughs> hopefully some day somebody can follow up that thread of that family story well the so, Beck ball the 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 writer historian filmmaker who whose uh, work we sort of based that section the the, the first sort of uh, south asian history uh, from the east coast perspective that's his work. And he's actually working with Cam to make a film specifically about uh, that period of, of the, uh, the first arrival oh. uh, of the, um, you know, South Asians, especially um, Bengali, um, Bengali Americans. So um, look for that. Uh, I think that's coming out probably in the next year or so. And he was so very I generous because he was, he's making that film, but yet yeah. still went with us to, or went with you to um, New Orleans to meet characters that he had been researching yeah and then we actually out there we're going to be doing one of these with wgbh the, P, the big P, pbs station in boston and vivek um will be one of the panelists um so he's a great guy and has it's great storyteller so folks should check it out 
So I think we got uh, just enough time for one last question from uh, the public. Uh, this is a question uh, from Sydney. Thank you for watching. Um, how can the youth be more involved with the future documentaries? How can the youth be more involved with future documentaries? And what are some of the main takeaways you'd like the youth to gain from documentaries? Renee, this one's for you. Oh, I thought Grace might want to answer that. Grace, please. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you watch documentaries. I mean, there. I think, I, I think you learn how. Like just like you, just as you learn to write by reading, I think you learn how to make how films are structured by watching them. Um, and you know, it's not very difficult these days to start shooting your own stuff with a phone, you know, just start recording your own family members. I mean, one of the things that was really exciting about this project was, you know, for example, um, Alex Fabros, who's in both episode three and four, he is a wealth of stories, experiences, you know, from working, being on the strike, you know, doing the farm worker strike, Delano, being a Vietnam War veteran, you know, coming back, teaching, learning Asian American studies. I mean, he's like Forrest Gump for this series, <laughs> right? Um, but, you know, just to sort of mine, just to sit in a room and have a conversation with him, like he kept saying, oh, you know, we should go out for a drink and I'll tell you some more stories. I'm like, yeah, I just want to hear the stories, right? That's so easy to do for a young person. Just ask your parents or your grandparents something about their childhood or, you know, tell me about your mother. I don't know. It, it, any, any prompt can just start people talking. And I think it's, it provides this incredible um, relationship to documentary that you didn't even know you have. It's, it's already there. You know, you just start talking about, you know, um, your own family history. Yeah, well, I think be a storyteller, right? Like not just in the documentary form, but be a writer, you know, be, be whatever medium that you choose. I mean, that's what's needed right now for us to be witnesses of, of the experience that we're, we're having, you know, past, present, future. Keep a diary well, during this pandemic because it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a primary document for somebody down the line who is gonna make a film about Asian Americans during coronavirus. <laughs> And keep a video diary. Yes. Video. And nice lighting if you, if you can. <laughs> well, that is some excellent advice from uh, you all. Thank you. I think that is all the time that we have uh, today. Um, I would like to thank our panelists, uh, Renee Tajima Pena, uh, Grace Lee, and S. Leo Chang. Um, and thank you, everybody watching from home. Uh, please remember, stay safe at home. And thank you for watching. There's a whole slew of programming for the whole month uh, for the LA Asian uh, Pacific Film Festival, a uh, virtual showcase with lots and lots of talkbacks. So uh, please come back and uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank oh, you. Tell, tell yes. all your friends to watch the broadcast May 11th and 12th, 8 Thank p.m., you. 7 p.m. Central. And also streaming online, I think at the same time, right? Yeah, so, we want people to tune in though. So that's May 11th, yeah. everybody. May 11th. Oh, that's May 12th. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, again. May 11th, you. catch it. Uh, episodes one and two, May 12th, or three, four, and five. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Oh, we have to go to the breakout room? <laughs> or, are we, or can we leave? Or...